It is the Rhetoric Warriors podcast. We are back here to straighten out public discourse. Complicated times require sophisticated techniques. Let's get, let's get some of that. Let's get sophisticated up in here. I'm Dr. Dan, PhD in rhetoric, late night comedy writer, rhetor median, founder of Rhetoric Warriors. I'm trying to get people out there to realize rhetoric can save us all if you would just let it. Uh, on the podcast, I do a few things. I talk to comedians about their politics, their lives, their careers. I convert people who are holding on to things that I think are not healthy, which is typically conservative right-wing politics. And that's fun. And I chat with a lot of persuasion pros, academics, cause havers, people trying to get things from here out into the world in living form. And that is definitely my... Uh, my guest today. I'm really excited about this because he's he's one of those guys who's a rhetorician masquerading as a sales guy. And I run into this a lot of people who are basically autodidacts where they've they've learned a lot. They've absorbed a lot about sales and business and and persuasion. And it hasn't been taken through the meat grinder of rhetoric exactly, but it's been taken through a meat grinder. And so it's fun to discover their meat grinders, uh, which brings me all around to the point that I think that's the genesis of what this guy does at Adaptive Growth. He's a sales consultant and it's built and manned by my guest today, John Hill. Wow. What an intro. I like, I'm, I'm astounded. I'm just so, I'm just so excited to not be on like a entrepreneur only podcast because everybody has one so it's not like a big deal so you're like i talk to comedians and i'm just like yay a whole yay. new group of people it's very exciting uh, thank you so live, much i can't just breathe business air i can't i mean i i make I, you know i work for businesses and i'll scuba into that stuff and i'll act like it's my my world but it's not and um so i i have to i have to bring you out of that somewhat <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, you blew me away on that, on our very first conversation where you're like, Hey, we do the same thing. I just don't got to carry the label. I was just like, I was mad. And then I was just like, that's just such a, a cooler, a cooler space to be right. Cause, uh, it's hard to be the person who wants to be called a salesperson because it's just like, Hey, this is what I do. This is what we're all doing. Let's just be upfront about it. And let's just teach people to do it the right way. Not like hide it and you know, all the, all the, all the righteous manipulation that people do, which is just like blowing people out of the water in the names of, well, it, if you want it bad enough and stuff like that. So I don't know, it's, it's, it's endlessly fascinating. I learn new things all day, every day about like how people think about persuasion and conflict and selling and relationships. It's the coolest, it's the coolest thing I've ever gotten to work on. Yeah. It's endless, right? I mean, they're endless like if, if you start from the core, the little glowing molten core of all human experience going around it, that glowing core that kind of tentacles out into everything is, hey, we have to, you have to influence the other things that are around you everywhere. Like every species on this planet does not, nothing exists in isolation. It exists in relationship, which means yeah. that you can just sit there and just take what the other party wants to throw into your sphere or you can take some agency and try to control that. So this is the art of agency, right? Yeah, man, I, this is so cool because I have always kind of felt like a bit like an outlier because I'm obsessed with sales. That's, that's the path that I came up in, but there is this like, like the marketing side of things, right? Like doing it like one to many is also fascinating because it's not exactly the same things that work, right? It like, you have to, you got to play with it a little bit, right? And you have to go get out there and try things. And uh, coming up, I'm a very black and white kind of person. Like, it, like if you're not winning, you're failing and like it sucks to be wrong and stuff. And so this idea of like, just go try stuff was really, really interesting, right? And the thing that we found is that when we did it right, the sales conversation felt entirely different than the way that like I was taught to go sell, like you got to go fight your way in here and over talk past the gatekeeper. And here's a bunch of fancy, like rebranded psychological tools that like is essentially the stuff that everybody hates, but because you're there to like do it for a reason for the company good and stuff like that. It, it's, it's just like such a weird 
thing. Um, but like, they're def they're definitely different mindsets, right? And it, and it gets me in trouble of like thinking about my stuff of like, cool, like the salesperson maximize the opportunity, maximize the relationship and everything. And then the marketing side of it is like, how do we make this easy? How do we make it more approachable? How do we like make sure that the time is well spent? And it's, it's an endless seesaw, you know, if you want it to be, right? If you just want to keep looking for the improvement loops, you know, versus, ah, that's good enough. Yeah, it's a weird, and this is the thing about, like sales is, is loaded. People have heard that word a lot in capitalist culture. They've seen it in stories. They know it's a compromised uh, identity. Like it's used as a villain identity. They've experienced yeah. villain salespeople. So they've, they've, they've got that in their head. Rhetoric and rhetorician, they don't. They've got a little bit of negativity about rhetoric because yeah. of political rhetoric, but they don't even really know what that means. And so I've got a pretty clean term, whereas you're coming into your term and having to do cleanup on it, which I yeah. see a lot like in your <laughs> website and stuff where you're talking, basically trying to recover that term sales and saying, hey, sales doesn't have to be what you're just talking about, this, this battle theory of I have to battle my way past all your resistance, no matter what you're doing versus yeah. an interpersonally based kind of persuasion sales model, which is what I think you're you're advocating still organized still powerful but it's not just breaking down doors that people want to keep putting up yeah they're i'm i got really lucky um i think the only reason i can think about it and do the things that i do because it's very customized to the individual like i've had conversations this week where we're talking about building out commission only sales teams and it makes sense um, and then there are certain situations where that doesn't make sense, right? It's all about the surrounding stuff, right? And what you're really trying to build towards. And so when you think about it like that, it's just, okay, how do you want to build this machine, right? And what's, what's really interesting to me is that in the name of not being a salesperson, you will see so many business owners go so far the other way. And they're, and they're like, John, sales are great. Cool. And then I want to keep asking questions. Like it is so like, it's in my nature. I just want to dig in there. Like, like, what do you mean? Great. Right. Cause that's how I came up. Like that's how I started. And so this, this idea of like shifting away from purposefully using technique and be, and just being more aware of myself and the other person and like where we were in the conversation and all of that. Okay. If that changes, will you let me know? Right. And like really being okay with that and not like using it as like a technique to be like, yeah, okay, so what would need to change for it to be worth the conversation? And all of the stuff that you learn when you're, you know, new, um, it, it's just, man, I, <laughs> I sound like a lunatic because it's like all I talk about, all I think about. No, it's, but again, it's this is what every I conversation. What I was, when we met on Lunch Club, I instantly was like, oh, rhetorician, just different term because you're thinking about this all the time and you're realizing the complexity of the world. Mm-hmm. And that's not off-putting, that's actually interesting to you. So you're going in and you're starting to literally, it's like going into a, you know, a new warehouse where nothing is labeled. And you're like, oh, I just need to label everything. <laughs> you're playing word biologist, botanist, where you're just like, oh, we have to write it down. This is what it is, tag it, let's put it over here. And so once we get everything tagged, maybe we can start doing some work. Mm -hmm. And it, it is that sense of like, even within sales, do you have replacement terms? Like, do you have a deck of term cards if people won't accept the idea of learning sales? Because I, I interchange rhetoric and persuasion a lot just because people don't know rhetoric yeah. and they trust, they kind of trust persuasion. It doesn't sound yeah. like a negative too much. You know, the, God, I love this. I've been talking about this all week with my team because we're going through this rebrand of like, how do we talk about ourselves? Because there's, even, even within my clients, right? The clients who hire me to help them navigate sales conversations, right? They're usually very introverted, very creative. They struggle with some of this stuff and they're out there trying to, trying to sell, set really great expectations, all of that. It's, you know, it feels like conflict. It's just easier to opt out. Those people don't see me as like a data-driven sales consultant. They see me as like the nurturing sales coach. The teams that hire me to build out their CRM systems don't see me as this other person at all. And it's, 
they're, they're different skill sets, honestly, right? Because the, the, the worst thing that happens in some of these situations is you just promote the person who was good at doing it before, right? Versus like putting the person who can go in there and actually like teach somebody else to do it. Like, I think a sales is this really unique proving ground for like leadership, because at the end of it, you have to get someone to go take action in on your behalf, pay an invoice, do, do this thing. Like leadership is that same thing when you think about it through that same lens, right? So sales has this unique opportunity to do that. But if you've been the producer the whole time of just, I go out and get it, I go out and get it. Cool. Now you got to get, you have to let these other people do that and fail and everything else. It's really difficult to do. <laughs> it is really difficult to do. It's been very interesting for my, in my digital marketing agency, because my partner, Matt, is hardcore sales. Like he was in tech sales, like big high dollar tech sales yeah. for a long time mm -hmm. and is a number cruncher guy. He does software and he's a brute. Like he's a sales brute and he's very good at it. He, he can destroy people in the room with why he's right and why it would help them if they listen to him. And I watch him do it. And we just pitched a new client on Monday and he pitched them because we don't pitch well together. We're, we, we, yeah. it's too much. Like he's too much and I'm too much. And together, <laughs> it's way too much. Yeah. And we absolutely. end up having to just sit there and one of us has to be silent because you can't add those, those really high intensity persuasion streams uh, together. You just can't do it. It's crossing the streams and, you know, sales busters and people break. I, uh, my, I had a business partner and we had a website design agency. It's where, it's where I learned all of this stuff and really, really great guy. And, um, like the, the, the system I use for like, kind of like thinking about how to talk to people is a system called disc, right. And just personalities and there's four quadrants and D D I S and C I won't go too far down the path, but he was a very high I and I'm a very high C. So I think in systems and repeatability and how can we do more with less? And he is, let's do something fun, right? He was, he was an artist. He went to art school. <clears throat> and so it was really interesting because we couldn't pitch together either, like at all. And uh, we were very like, okay, cool. You got this one. Yeah, cool. I'm going to shut up. I'm just taking notes. I'm not going to ask anything at all. And so the first couple of times was like really rough because I'm trying so hard not to ask a question and he's just trying so hard to like rush through it. And this is going to be great. And like, you're going to love it. And I'm like, wait a minute. Can we ask a couple of questions here? Cause he's trying to force himself away from there. I'm trying to force myself more towards being like not a robot. And uh, it, 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 it was, it was just easier. Hey, John's just going to take some notes. Cool. I'm just going to take notes, but man, it's like that. You just have to know that that's there. Yeah, so and you, important. And you do like, you have to, <clears throat> like when you go in and design these things, I think this is one of the things that I like about your approach from what I can glean is that you like to walk in with a plan. You, you don't like unplanned environments. You've got a lot of tools and technologies and tactics that you've pre-built yeah. over the years that you've been doing this. And you like to know which ones that you think you're going to apply in that situation. Yeah. And that is, again, like a super rhetorician's strategy because pre-made stuff applied with thought, I, you can have a hard time beating that system. So <laughs> we might be stumbling onto like the thing that I think is my, my like biggest secret weapon because I've just not been able to think about it in a way that I can communicate it well. But like I have, a, I have an ability of looking at things and seeing them in the same way, right? So then what I do is when I think about like, how am I going to improve in this thing? It, it really helps me kind of define and segment and attack things in, a, in kind of a unique way. So like, um, I think of sales, I'm much, I'm, I'm also a Kung Fu instructor. I, I learned and trained um, in a local school here for 15 years in an art called Wing Chun. Um, which is just meant to be the most effective, short range, close range art you can you can do. It's not meant to be in a ring or anything else. And the limitation of the art is what makes it so great in the realm it's supposed to be used in. It's going to get crushed in UFC fights. It's not what it's for. That doesn't mean that it's bad, right? And so coming up in that art, there were some movies that came out and it really kind of changed like the focus 
focus of it. It really kind of like painted it in a better light. But before that is probably the most shit talked martial art you could you could find on the internet like wing chun it looks like patty cake and so then some movies come out sheds it in a bit of a different light but it's still everything is held against this like ufc thing right and it and it really okay it works there it's great it's great for martial arts it's awesome for this and this and this and this and this but like that's not the thing that we're training for we're fundamentally training for a different kind of situation and outcome and obviously you can make lots of conversations about well if it would work there it would work here but you know the limitation makes the environment is the, is the thing that i really think about a lot when when i'm thinking about improving is what do we limit so that way we have the best outcome possible and it comes from that from that idea of like having to spend a lot of time validating why i'm training in an art that's not you know mixed martial arts well john okay so you're doing karate no i don't do karate okay cool so you're doing this like ufc thing no i don't do that either okay what are you doing this 400 year old art that like nobody likes oh why do you do that like like that's what it was it was, it was really interesting but like thinking about why would i spend so much time working on this art if i didn't think it was going to work i obviously do think it's going to work but like what else do i need to know about that that other people don't know because there, there's this education thing there because everybody everybody was confused. Like, John, you're, you're an adult. It's time to put the Ninja Turtle thing down. Like, you know, maybe take a job that might take away time from training. Absolutely not. It was, it was very, like, like I was making career decisions around my, my ability to go train in this art and people like didn't get it. But now I can look at anything through like this like Kung Fu lens. Like, is this done with, with intention or not? And so when I think about even on lunch club, like when I'm networking, it's okay, it's for these buckets. And lunch club does this amazing thing of building that as part of their onboarding, right? Which I think is really cool and unique because it kind of forces people who are not intentional about things like networking, uh, biz development and stuff and kind of gives them some guidance, which is really cool. Yeah, it does. It moves it moves people down that um, those pathways. It, does, it limits people towards those things, which you know, I think is <clears throat> a good insight that you're pulling up, this idea of, the martial arts of persuasion, you know, like uh, blending those two worlds, I think is, a, is is strong. And it's the idea also that like getting deeply into any sort of learned system that other people have not learned gives you such an advantage. And I talk to people about this when they want to, when they find out what I do and they're like, well, you know, does that mean we're going to argue? And I'm like, you don't want to argue with me. That won't work out well. Yeah. Same way, like if I'm doing stand up, you don't want to heckle me because I've done stand up for 35 years in the worst clubs in the country. You do not want to play <laughs> that game with me because I've, I've got so interested in it and I've learned it at such depth that it won't be fun for you. And it definitely won't be fun for me because I would just hurt you. you know? Yeah, that it's, it's just um, when I have been here before. I've been here before. This might be new for you, but I have been here before, right? Like um, I was playing poker one time in this underground poker room and this, and this guy wins this big hand and he's like cheering. Yeah. And in and this, this old timer, right? Like the old guy, he's got the full on electric cowboy get up and everything with the bolo tie underground game. You got to know someone to get in. And he goes, I'd like you've been here before. Uh, right. Nice. And then it, it was like, like everyone is just like, yeah, like this kind of like old sage, like poker room. Like I'm the youngest guy in there by like probably 10 years at this point. I love it. What a great line. And uh, like, like, like it just, before. it just stuck with me. Like, man, like, because like uh, in coaching, the very next rep is so much improved just because like you're doing it one more time and it's not the first time. It's like in all of our coaching, it's like, cool, do it again. Because like, you don't need any, improvement or steps or anything, just, just say it again, because just by doing it again, you're going to be better. Like, like that's one of the things I'm obsessed about with stand up is just that ability to get up in front of, like, I do it one-to-one. -one, right. And I'll, and I'll say something to someone and it doesn't land. I'm like, cool. Think about that in a little bit and then move on. Like, why didn't it land? You know? Um, but it, it comes from this idea of like stand up of like, okay, Okay, it worked, you know, some of the stuff that works like up North is not going to work down here in Texas. You know, like you might have to like change a little bit of the premise, the, the underlying components of like the comedic structure still work. You might just have to kind of change like the valences of it, you know, which is kind of what I think about just all branding, right. You're just kind of changing 
the signs on these things, but people want the same things largely. Yeah, I businesses force me to figure out how to simplify all the stuff that I would grab out of rhetoric and just simple development, like develop it down into basic communication so that I can communicate it in 30 to 60 seconds, which is about the amount of time they can listen. And mm -hmm. not that it's a bad thing, they're just busy. And so I'm like, that's the communication challenge. Can I take these super complicated things, figure out an information structure that can hold those still steady without losing the information and then yep. turn it into basic communication. And so like the one you're talking about, this is the rhetoric for business Substack that I write is trying to give people all those technologies that I've built over the last five to seven years. And one of them is this, uh, the acronym is it's four M's and then an N and a P. And it stands for a mega macro mid crow, which is a word I made because I needed it. Uh, <laughs> micro nano and Pico. And when you actually look at any messaging system and really any kind of theory system, you start with that, like here are the mega thoughts about it down to the, what you're talking about, which is, and stand up, especially when you repeat a script, when you move it to a new audience, when you're in a different mood, when you're dressed differently, all that is Pico and nano learning. It's that micro below micro feel where it mm -hmm. gets to be intuitive and you can't really teach that. Like I can't yeah. tell somebody, there was a guy who took a workshop from me, a bunch of workshops, really good guy, but he had a PhD in um, physics and he was a bit spectrum -y, not aware of things. And when he was performing, he would keep his hand like this. And one of the other students leaned over and goes, what's with the gay hand? Like, <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a gay signaling hand, right? So I'm like, hey, you know, you've got to, you can't do that unless it's going to be part of the act because everybody's looking at your hand. It's too mm -hmm. strong a symbol. And so that kind of micro feedback people never get. And they don't do that super development so that when they get to the moment, it suddenly seems like they're otherworldly good at something. Yeah, it is. Man, oh God, I love this conversation. Uh, there's this line in martial arts training of like, you know, the, you know, the master at the first touch. There's like this like parable about it, you know, and uh, you hear it and like, oh, okay, okay, okay. But like, it's universally applicable, right? Because in, in the art that I first started to learn called Wing Chun, the way that you initiate a touch from a bridge feels very different. And when you're doing it with like your practice partners and stuff, you have this level of stiffness and quality because you just don't know that there's a way of having it without having that quality to it. Right. But in your mind, you're like, oh, I'm relaxed. This is great and stuff. And then you line up with someone who's significantly further up than you are in it it feels different. And just because it feels different, you know, you're about to get worked. Right. <laughs> and it, and it was just, it's like, it's such a cool thing. And so, um, I, I made a move over to jujitsu before the pandemic and trained for about a year. And like, same thing happens there, right? Like the grips are different. The contact points are different, but like, there's a, there's a, there's a fundamental difference between dealing with someone who has lots of hours and someone who understands the concepts philosophically, but doesn't have those reps, right? Like, and you know it in the poker, you know it in the standup, you know it on a Zoom call, you know it on a sales call. Like when you know it to look for it, it it's, you, know, you can just see it everywhere. I love well, it. And it's so comforting. It's an instant. I've thought about this a lot in the context of Lunch Club because I've done 500 of them now and I've studied it the whole time, took notes on all of those interactions because I wanted mm -hmm. to understand what it meant to do interpersonal work in a Zoom call in that context. And it is the sense of, as soon as you run into that, you should feel this, this sense of this aura of comfort. It should be like, Oh, okay. I can just relax. Cause this person is so uh, ready to do this. And so good at it that I know I'm going to be taken care of through this. Yeah, man. It, it's, um, there's this concept in, in, in selling that we talk about a lot. It's framing, right? Setting the expectations. So that way, you know, if you're going to be uncomfortable inserting yourself meaningfully later on, Hey, are we going to do business or not? One of the best ways to relieve that pressure is to get an agreement before you need it. Right. So uh, I was coaching someone about this this week and they were like, it feels like blatant manipulation. And I'm like, well, here's the thing. It kind of is but it's like a trap for you because when you say, Hey, at the end of this, I need to figure out if we should keep talking or not. Like it, that, that is setting an expectation and setting a frame. It's getting an agreement. 
because the cool thing about it is that when you lean into that, it, it's going to put pressure on you to perform that thing that maybe you don't really want to do that hard step, right? Because if you just put pressure on your future self that it's going to be okay, you're not going to do it, right? And it's, it's, it is, but it's more, it's as much for yourself as it is for them, because then you just get to have a much better conversation because they're not worried about all the other stuff. Yeah. And I think the, there's so many sub concepts here that I find again, fascinating, which again is why I wanted to talk to you. Cause I know you find fascination in it too, but the sense of authenticity, when you can hold on to these <clears throat> techniques you're being given in an artificial way, right? Like insert yeah. yourself, like do the ask, you know, are we going to, is there business here? And when you just give people that dictate as an informal or a formalized, you know, kind of instruction, it does feel alien, but sure. once they do yeah. it, and they figure out their own way of doing it and adapting it and still doing the same thing, but with their own, you know, wrinkle to it, then it becomes such a, such a nice tool to have. And I know even like on the lunch clubs, how I get out of those, like if I'm on a bad call, like the person doesn't have the communication skills to be enjoyable to talk to. Um, <laughs> I'll put it that way. I'm like, I know it almost instantly, but like they're asking no probe questions. They're showing no emotional reactions. They have nothing to offer me. They're asking me pro forma questions. All these things. I have a list of what makes you a terrible person to talk to. Yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, but I'm like, okay, like if it's particularly bad at about six, seven minutes, I'll cut it. And I'll be like, hey, uh, I'm going to get some more coffee. Good talking to you. You know, uh, let's hook up on LinkedIn. If there's anything, you know, you want to talk to, hit me, hit me with, and I'll send you some links. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them won't take that clue because they're so bad at communication yeah they can't see i just did a five-part close on them <laughs> to to end this they're like well what yeah. about i'm like yeah that's a good idea too but i'll i'll hit you up later and i will not not close because it's so painful to listen to them yeah but i had to learn how to do that because when you first start doing those you're like well i don't want to be rude i'm like well you're not being rude you're you're using a close technique mm -hmm. that offers them a future thanks them and you know ties things off if they can't do that that's that's their problem yes man i i had a call with a guy who was running a mastermind right a friend of mine was in it and seeing a ton of value in it and i was like look i don't think i'm a prospect but like i think that communities are cool if you're in a mastermind group and getting like really great value in it i would love to hear more about it and and so he was like cool i'll connect you with the guy we have the call and the guy makes this statement very early on which just kind of shuts me down for the rest of the call. Like, like I'm really big about like, Hey, let's, let's spend the time because we're here. Right. So I don't typically end calls early, but I will do kind of like a cool. We're not together. So <laughs> this is going to sound really weird, but like, let's, let's lean into the exercise kind of deal. Like let's lean into the training here kind of deal. And so sure. this guy makes this statement very early on and he goes, John, you know, isn't it just nice to work with people who got the same worldview as you do? And I said, I said, so man, you presumptively I, closed on your worldview. Yeah. And I said, uh, I said, I said, man, uh, help me out. I'm a little bit confused. Like, like, what do you mean by that? And he goes, and he goes, well, just take something like the 10 commandments. And then he kind of trails off and I was just like, cool. I, I am never going to be a fit for this group. I'm glad my friend is seeing value out of it. Cool. Let's just enjoy, enjoy the conversation, and the experience. So then we get to the end of it and he's trying to close me. So John, so what do you think? I'm sorry, think about what, you know, and that's the hard part for me. Like, like that's where all the training kicks in because I, I can't wait to answer your question. I can't wait to tell you why this is a no for me, but I can't like, I'm not going to be able to do it in a way that's going to like allow us to probably part on good terms because I just, I get very dismissive whenever I've made a decision as do most people, whenever we're like very aware of it. And so I was just like, Hey, cool. Think about what he's like the group. I said, Oh, I'm not a fit for this. Sorry. Well, you had to know that we were here for a reason. Right. And this is, this is my biggest pet peeve about sales in general. This, this, I, this assumption, because it happens all the time in all conversations, right? This like, like assume close, well, you had to know there was going to be an investment involved, you know, kind of thing that everybody does. And it's just like, why would they know that? If you didn't sell them, if they've not read about it, if they've not, if they've not been informed, you're just going to show up like you're the problem, right? And the only reason you're the problem is because you've done this too many times, right? 
right? So maybe back up a little bit, make sure that you're on the same page with them, right? That guy didn't start the conversation with any questions about like, what are we here to do or anything else like this? And so at the end of it, he has no choice but to be mad that I'm not playing by his game, but he didn't explain the rules of the game in the first place. So I'm opting out of the game at this point, right? <clears throat> yeah, I think and that's a really good way of looking at it. Go ahead. It's it's such a, it's taken me forever to get to that point, to like be able to like think about it that way, hold it that way, navigate through it and and leave and not be mad that I wasted time talking to someone that, you know, I'm not going to do anything with in the, in the, in the future. Right. Because in the sales training that I was brought up in, it's like opportunity cost, opportunity cost, right. you're spending time with, with certain people means you're not spending time with people who might be the best clients for you. Right. That just beat you over the head with the Kool-Aid of it. And, and certain great parts of it have stuck. Right. But there's also parts of it, just like in any other kind of big belief system that are limiting and cause you to drink too much of the Kool-Aid and, you know, I, I was in the army. And so I had that period of whenever I got home of like, oh, you're in the Navy, the Navy sucks. You know what? <laughs> it all sucks, right? Like, like if, the, if that's your calling and that's the thing you love to do, that is awesome. I was terrible for it. I, I, did, I did the shortest time that I could to make good and be honorable. Um, but for some people, it's their calling. And I fully respect that. Go do your thing. But fighting about like the differences and like which one is better is a little bit absurd, you know? Yeah. It's, yeah. So so I've been that guy. So I've been that guy three or four times, right? Like I was, I was army John who couldn't understand why people would join the Marine Corps or the Navy or, you know, the air force or anything else like this. I was Kung Fu John who was, who was very confused as to why anybody would do anything else. Huh? Kung Fu John. Kung Fu John. What? Like, like that was it. Like you didn't call me on Tuesdays or Thursdays or Friday nights or Saturday mornings for about 13 years because you just knew I was going to be at the school. I was not answering your call. Like, that's just how it was. Um, and then, and then there was entrepreneurial John who was drinking way too much of like the hustle 24 seven, you can sleep when you're dead kind of stuff. And now like there's this version, which is probably the most balanced of, of any of that stuff. And just, you know, <laughs> got to take care of yourself and moderate and, you know, just be aware of where you are and how much, how much influence you're picking or you're drinking from the, from the, from the sources you trust. Right. Because, when you, when you like it, it's, it, it's just there, but when you don't like it, Oh my, you know, and we have these, there's no balance in that approach, which is frustrating to me. Yeah. I think I got lucky because I went to grad school at 22 and ran into some rhetoricians, some really smart guys very early on. And I remember the day that I kind of adopted the, the rhetoricians way, which is why I call that newsletter that, I was coming back from a lecture. I was a TA for a big persuasion class. And I've had the guy, David Payne, who I remember learning this from on my podcast 20 times. He's great. But he um, he said something uh, during the lecture. I can't remember what it was. But it was about politics or it was about something. And it was meta narratives about there's, a, there's an entire world that's been pre-constructed before you got here. And most people are just running the program. They're not interrupting the program. Yeah. It's just the program is there. It's very strong. And that's what most people do. And I remember going, yeah, <laughs> like I <I've> never <laughs> really, I was 22. I'd never thought of the world in that way. And I remember walking back with him back to the office and I went, yeah, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that's pre-made that we just are born into. And, and there's a whole academic tradition with that, with social construction, reality, and a lot of philosophy, but just that idea that you can be up, up above it. And this is the, this is the core of the, what the rhetoric uh, perspective offers, I think in some ways differently than sales rhetoric forces you to be outside the system. It never lets you go in and absorb another system. I cannot, I was raised Catholic, but I cannot absorb Christianity anymore. I could not absorb military. I cannot absorb any inspirational system because I am a rhetorician and it's like a body armor where you're, you turn everything meta. And when I'm when running into guys like that in sales and I run into them every once in a while in lunch club, mm -hmm. I just break them with meta. Like I just turn, I just, you know, lift up out of the system and go, why did you just try to sell me like that? And they're like, what yeah. do you mean? I'm like, well, you clearly that's, that's your system for doing this. Mm -hmm. Like, do you ever change that system or do you just do it the same, no matter what the uh, clues are from the other person? I'm just curious. And I'll tell them like, as long as I'm yeah. doing it meta, I'm not trying to attack them or tear them down, but man, it, it just breaks them. 
They are not well, ready to go meta. Maybe it, it's, uh, I love this. I, I love this whole thing because it's like, do you know why you're there? Like, do you have that much intention? Right. And um, when I started networking, I felt, I felt like this fraud because I didn't have a network. Right. And my, my business partner, huge networker knew everybody in town. And so he, I, we, we'd have coffee, we're talking shop and he, every other person would, Hey man, how's it going? Hey man. I was like, how do you know all these people? He's like, you're going to get there. Why me? No, no. Right. And it, it was just like absurd that like, I would be able to have a sphere of influence on par with this. Right. And then it was just intentional, intentional thing. Right. And so then I started to feel a little different kind of limiting belief around the idea of like asking for referrals and like, like why I was telling people I wanted to meet with them. You know, like you say the things over and over and over again. And if you're, if you're aware of it, I, you know, it start, starts to change meaning. You start to think about it a little bit differently. And so I used to be very much that guy of, you know, just here's some technique, here's some technique, here's a thing. Let me find a ledge. If, if I can find a ledge, I'm, I'm on there. Right. And then let, let, let me just create a little, a little bit of space. It's going to be in there. And when I didn't want to do any of that anymore. Right. Because like what I, what I started to find was that the more that I put pressure on the conversation of like, Hey, this is going to be great, blah, blah, blah. And like, shoving people against the wall to see if they're going to kind of bounce back and do these things is that like the the relationships and the scope creep that was like happening with our clients was just is a slog right and it was just why are we trying so hard you know there are people who want to work in the way that we want to work like maybe we should just go find those people and not just have people who say that they want to do that but it's just because they don't want to spend what the other guys want like it, it was, a, it was such like a weird thing to think about of just like, yeah, it's different and it's less expensive than what you're used to, but there's a reason for that. And you might hate it. Let's talk about why you would hate that first. Never felt like a sales person, right? Okay, great. So how do we do that intentionally? How do we, how do we, how do we do these kind of things? And so it's leading, leading with that conflict, right? Because I think of sales and marketing and persuasion as separating the people that you want to talk to versus the people that you don't, right? Because someone has got to, when there's a salesperson involved in that thing, someone has got to take that time to have those conversations. So when you can qualify well and use marketing and persuasion and influence and stuff like that, you put your salespeople in a spot to where they get to really, oh, we're not going to work with you. I'm sorry. Which is cool because if you never get to that spot, your view of sales is just use car lots. Yeah, it's it's pretty ugly when you're when you consider yourself the universal salesperson, and you, and you don't target. Um, again, part of my training in rhetoric is this hyper targeting, and targeting in in ways that go, I think, you know, more towards qualitative. I guess research um, and marketing would be more descriptive of it. But this kind of deep phenomenological research that if I'm really going to try to influence somebody, I want to know what, what they are. I want to know how they live, not what they buy. You know, I get yeah. it. And that's cool. You know, that's a little bit of information, but if you ever study really great phenomenological researchers, Oh my God, the stuff <laughs> they find about people that are just so textured and, and deep seated and, and real. And you're like, wow, that's like, I remember reading a, uh, an ethnography once by a Japanese academic who studied her own anorexia and wrote about it and was rescuing the concept from the way that uh, the dominant culture had settled it, that here's what anorexia means. She's like, yeah, there's a lot more going on in here. It's not this sense just of uh, control that young girls exert like the dominant explanation she goes let's take a look at all the things that it actually means to these people that are going through it and it mm -hmm. just became this multi-dimensional life experience and you're like that's that's a real understanding of target so if i want to sell to that person or if i want to affect that person i now have some actual information to figure out what tactics they need in order to, to make changes and I do yeah. this a lot with politics. I did a three webinar series on explaining MAGA to people because they're so confusing 
to non MAGA people. And I'm like, well, think of it like I always do of start with a pie. All right. It's got multiple pieces, say 50 slices. And just realize that MAGA phenomenon has 50 different sub variations within it. Yep. And until you start to understand each one of those and can identify them and adjust your persuasion to that, you're going to fail because your Absolutely. messaging no longer fits that slice of pie. I, you know, we were doing, we're launching this website design company as me and my partner. And we're like, both just trying to learn about marketing and branding and stuff. And everyone talks about like, know your avatar, know your, know your client avatar, you know, the, the client persona, if you're in sales and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, I hated going through all of that stuff. I, I hated it. It felt it's like, so just like, a, it's it so... is well, like no one takes it to the depth that it really needs to do. And then I, I signed up for one, um, after starting adaptive growth and, uh, the guy just talked about it a little bit different, just a little bit different than, than I had thought about before. And he goes, look, everyone is just like, okay, like age range, what do they do? What do they drive and stuff like that? And he goes, I want to talk about why they watch the shows that they watch. And I was just like, okay, right? And like still skeptical, like this this still sounds like the same stuff everyone else talks about. And he goes, he goes, uh, he, he goes, the people in my audience, they like to watch billions, but they don't like Shark Tank. And I was like, oh, well, that is rather interesting. Like, like there's a lot of depth there and stuff. And then like that's what really kind of got me started to think about the depth of my and of like what I of what I do, right? Because like everyone's expecting me to come in and be like a Grant Cardone person with like lots of pressure and follow up until you die and everything else like that. And it's like, it's not what we do. If that's what you want, we're not going to be a good fit. And we like, essentially you got to be able to show that depth to people, because if you don't show that depth to people, right back to that kind of 30 second thing that you're talking about a second ago, if I can't lead with the fact that like, Hey, I know what you think this is and it's not, do you want to have a conversation? I'm the guy trying to prove a point that they don't want to talk. Well, John, I'm not even in sales. That's what you do. I'm a founder, right? Or like I'm a podcast host and it's like, cool. Like, does your podcast bring in qualified leads for your business? Well, yes, it does. Okay, great. That's a sales technique. Let's talk about how to make it better. So it's it's weird because I love being like, cool, here's the thing that you're using. Like, let's just make it a little bit better, but also not being that guy because if you don't think of it in that way, man, it's John, this is not a sales tool. This is just a podcast. Cool. That is a brand. It's part of your brand. You put it out there. It's very important to you, right? You do it with a, like a high level of consistency and intentionality. Yeah. Cool. It's a sales tool. It's a sales tool. Like yeah. it goes back let's to use the, it the best way we can. It goes back to the problem of terminology in, in these things. And I was For working sure. on a thing the other day about the rhetoric of rhetoric. Because essentially what I do these <laughs> days is, is uh, I create, you know, a rhetoric of rhetoric. I'm like, so here's what rhetoric is. It means I just defined it for you, which is massively important in rhetoric. And nobody's arguing with me that, oh, that's not rhetoric. Like they'll start with, you know, their understanding and I destroy that expertise base because they don't know anything. And then they, you know, back down to the PhD and the fact that I set it as 2,500 years of persuasion study across every form of persuasion that you could, that you can think of, mm -hmm. like rhetoric could easily study sales as a rhetorical process. Um, but once you can get people over into your term, then you can start, you know, if you get them comfortable there and I, I do this stuff, not to make people uncomfortable or to depower people, but to get them into my terminology so that we can have a shared set of terms and concepts, yeah. and then we can do some work together. Cause to me, it's never about dominating that's a bad type of rhetoric it's a bad type yep. of influence laterality you know within the system of let me do my expertise and then we're going to go if we need your expertise we'll use that too is a really to me a much more functional system and people are comfortable with it mm -hmm. you know once i run out of my expertise i'll stop talking because i don't i don't know beyond what i know but, but when it comes to rhetoric i need to get people over into my terms and like with you, like with sales, do you, like I asked you this earlier, what do you have other terms other than sales? 
You know, I, I kind of rail against it, honestly, which um, <clears throat> a friend of mine, he loves to talk about how, like how like entrepreneurs make terrible ego decisions, you know, and, like, like he, he named his podcast in a way that like, it wouldn't show up for like any kind of SEO thing. And I was like, how do you feel about that now? And he's like, stupid ego decision, don't do it. And uh, I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty adamant about the fact that like, you need to lean all the way in, like lean, like all the way. And like, like I make a statement in the book that when you can see the cell in any conversation, you like remove yourself from being sold. You know, this, this idea of like, you get sold the things that you do, you dislike, but you can't wait to buy the things you love. Right. But if you are aware that like in pretty much any conversation, someone has an agenda, they, they want you to do something. They're there for a reason. Like once you're aware of that, you're going to be less likely to get emotionally invested in it and talk into something that you don't want to do, but you got to make the decision that it's always there. Not that like, well, that happens in other conversations, but my stuff's different, John, like, which is what, like, that's the place that we have to start at. So we always start with a personality assessment so we can talk about the reason why you think about sales the way that you do is tied to how you think about everything. Right. And so we can start there and that becomes part of like the training tool. Like you don't have to go be more, abrasive or knock down doors, but maybe understand that like you are giving this person way too much room to not make a decision ever because you don't want to ask a clear cut question. Let's start there, you know? So yeah. I, I yeah. Think, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to wrap up and say like, like I, I, but for me, and maybe this is just me trying to make it harder on myself is like, you need to admit that you're a salesperson and then it's noble when you do it the right way. And I think that's a totally viable uh, strategy as well. Like instead of abandoning, abandoning the term or replacing the term, you recover the term. You know, and I see this a lot in politics. The right has a, a much stronger um, orientation in its messaging to slander, to stain. Like they're really good at it. They're mm-hmm. really good at staining people and terms and movements. And it doesn't matter. They're just really good at using negative communication, uh, negative rhetoric. And like the terms liberal, you know, that, that yeah. term has become so demonized, such an ugly, yep. vile term, because they've dumped so much venom in it for so long that yep. it's really hard to use that term. You can't use that term just without recovering it, because if you do, it, it's been too dominated by darkness. So you have yeah. to bring it back into the light. And you do that with the same type of techniques. You're like, okay, I'm not a liberal. I'm a super liberal. Let me tell you what that means. And you yeah. watch like Bernie <laughs> Sanders did this. He's, I'm a, yeah, I'm a socialist. Yeah, that's what yeah. I am, American socialist. And I've seen some work around that with like people calling at a, maybe it's a social democracy, that we live in a social democracy, you know, and adding adjectives back yeah. into the noun is a great way to recover terms. And I did this with my branding for rhetoric warriors. I called it ethical only persuasion. You know, mm-hmm. that's what I teach. I do not promote or teach unethical persuasion techniques. They're effective. You can use them. Fine. I get it. A lot of people do use them. I think they're destructive and they destroy democracies, but yeah. Hey, you know, um, and with you like sales, you keep using, you keep saying sales, like it's just noun. It's a naked noun. Are, are there adjectives that you would add to it to make it yours? Oh man. Well, if, if I had a good, if I had a good answer to this, I'd probably be much more well known at this point. Um, <laughs> the, you know, we we came up with a way to help people sell because during during the middle of the pandemic, we we just had to pivot, just like most people did. Um, and so I started trying to place salespeople in inbound situations. Right, if we could build that like application versus sales process kind of vibe to it, then you don't have to train people through all the mindset stuff and everything else that I've had to go learn to go sell really well. You just get to qualify really well, right? So that's what we started to do. And everybody was like, well, John, we want people who sell like you. And I was like, well, okay. And like, I don't really sell in the exact same manner that I've been brought up in because, you know, my experiences lead me to think about it a little bit differently. Like I had a Jerry Maguire moment and, you know, in my, in my classroom of like, guys, does it really make sense that we want the worst for everybody in these conversations? (laughs) And everyone is like, John, you don't like money. And I'm like, no, I love money. I also like easy money. Like I want to, I want it to be so easy. Right. And so I began to diverge a little bit from like all the people in my class, you know, and the, and the people who I was like spending the most time with, like learning this skill. And, um, 
So great. Okay. What does this mean? And the thing that we came up with was Sherpa, which is just like trying to get people to think about like the mindsets you need to be in to do consultative selling well, as opposed to just focusing on the techniques you can use to do consultative selling well. Right. So Sherpa is just around those ideas, like, like the mindsets you need to be to do, to do it well. Right. So skeptical, helpful, empathetic, resolute, practiced, and accepting. If you're in those, if you're in those things, all of your techniques that you apply afterwards are going to be from a place of, you know, uh, being like Yoda, as opposed to like being like Vader, which is like, you know, what my business partner talked about all the time. He's like, you, you can go be a Sith Lord, or you can be a Jedi. It's a decision you get to make every time. And it was like, okay. So like, I started learning all that from that intention and like this very kind of like Kung Fu light of, you know, you can, you can use the whole repertoire against people. You don't have to, right. Are you here to snuff? Are you here to like injure kind of deal? Right. Like it was very like the paths mirrored so closely to me. It was, it was really interesting. So, um, yeah. Are you using it for good or using it for bad? Are you using the technique just to get the technique in, or are you aware of the situation, the push, the pull, the personalities in play and stuff like that? So we want to start there before you start to apply technique. So that's why we did it that way. But I'm, I'm very much the technique guy. So I'm curious for you. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question. You've been asking me questions and let, letting me ramble. How do you balance the idea of um, ethical rhetoric, ethical persuasion with also sometimes you got to be the guy who's going to sit and noodle and figure out how you can talk about it in the way that it catches. Does that sure get in the way for you? No, not, I think. So the, the question is, are ethical techniques effective enough to just use ethical techniques in the world? Right? Like, yeah. Can you get where you want to go? Can you get the sales that you need? Can you get the conversions? Can you get the, the changes? just using ethical techniques and uh well okay so hold on i that's not actually my question um okay. because because i do think that you can get there but i think that somebody right in the strategy department has got to be okay let's go try to sell this to people okay no that didn't work okay let's go okay why didn't that work how are we going to talk about it you know in kind in trying to you know you're riding the line a little bit there of did, did it work no what did we learn how do we adjust kind of deal do you agree? Oh, I'm still not quite sure what you're asking. Reframe it again. Give it, hit me again. Um, so, okay. I tell everybody, don't oversell yourself. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Know who you can help the best. Qualify out everybody else like this because the outcomes are important. The stability is important and everything else like this. I'm also the guy you hire when you want to figure out who you should be selling your stuff to in the most, in the most efficient way possible. So sometimes those, those ideas feel like they're like do as I say, not as I do kind of deal. Do you ever deal with that and struggle with that? So uh, the bloodless technique, is that what you're talking about? Like it doesn't kind care of, who yeah. it's studying. It's just gathering information so that you're going to adjust to it and be more successful versus things that actually take care of people in the persuasion process. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't, I guess I don't really separate those very much because to me, you're never going to do good persuasion with people that by my definition, sort of an ethical only definition is that there's a lot of things to it, but it, it, essentially the core of it is that both sides have to win. Like if you win money and the other side loses money and doesn't really get value that you offered, that's not an ethical outcome. You know, it's not, it's probably not ethical technique that you use to get there. And it's definitely not ethical outcome. And so to me, like when you look at here, my list of ethical outcomes, here are the list of what I would consider to be ethical techniques. And I harvest from these all the time. Now, if I go into things like hardcore data, you know, things like that, that don't really have an ethical, you know, and they may be, you can paint whatever picture you want that, that people don't want. They haven't agreed to give away, but you're getting mm -hmm. that stuff anyway. Then you get a little iffy, but it all still goes back to the outcome. Like, not that the ends justify the means, but that you're aware of your means as you go through and it's all directed towards a good end. And to me, when I have uh, people from alternative belief systems on my podcast, I tell them very early, like, I don't care what you believe. I don't care what anybody believes. It doesn't really matter to me. What I care about is two things. It's the process that got you to, to where you believe. Like, was that an ethical 
you know, uh, above board process mm -hmm. and your process now of taking that stuff out to other people to try to get them to believe what you believe. So these are process questions and that's where I live. I don't really live in out in that, that those kind of outcomes. I live in process. And if your process is clean, you're pretty safe. I think. Hmm. Interesting. So how do you, okay. Um, Man, I love this. Okay, so how do you know you're not talking yourself into whatever you decide to talk yourself into in those moments, right? Because, you know, uh, I talk about sales mindset all the time and all, all those people who were like, well, if you show them the value, they will buy and follow up until they're there. And like, if they raise the hand, they're there for like, you can drink that Kool-Aid and it makes sense and stuff like that. So how do you, how do you check yourself that you're, you're, you're more Skywalker and less, you know, Sith Lord? I think in some ways it's not even Skywalker. It's more Obi-Wan once he was out of the game and just kind of old and just watching it. Yeah. You know, he really wasn't yeah. fighting in there anymore because he was, he knew what all the fights were yeah. and he knew where they were going and he knew the outcomes essentially. And so um, I think like when I started with the idea of the rhetorician's way is that it, it never stops checking. It never stops checking on itself or the, or the interactants in it, it never gets swept up in the moment. So it's always this critical analysis, this rhetorically oriented analysis of what's happening. So I specifically drink the Kool-Aid of rhetoric because it, to me, makes the Kool-Aid. It looks the Kool-Aid, it studies the Kool-Aids. Yeah. And so it's, it is a Kool-Aid drink itself. Mm -hmm but it's aware that it's a Kool-Aid drink and it's fine with that. Like it's so a by, so by, so by, so by being so aware of the situation, you, you detach from the situation kind of deal. Or you super attach to the situation in a way that like you're in both spaces. I think that's, um, oh, again, one that's, thing interesting. that's cool about rhetoric is that rhetoric is above it and in it at the same time. Mm -hmm. And when you get that dual consciousness where you're always monitoring what's happening, in, a, in an ecological way, I don't know if you read the book or not, but one of the chapters is about rhetorical ecology as a perspective that a really well-trained yeah. rhetorician comes into things and sees ecologies. So they do see the possibility of immoral action because it's in the ecology, but mm -hmm. they move it out of the ecology. And they're like, now we don't need those. Uh, and like what you're talking about with targets, it sees, oh, there's 9,000 targets. We only need these three, move the other... 8,000, whatever out yeah. until it gets a clean ecology. And then it's like, yeah, there you go. Oh man. What's my question? What's the single, uh, no, that's going to be way too hard of a question. What's the best way to get to that level, to get to that like place of, you know, in, in Kung Fu, we talked about like, when you, when you get to like mastery, you know, like once you can look back and you just see that it's all just time, right? Like talent, talent doesn't get you very far at the end of the day. It seems like a really big deal when you are looking up at talent and it's the thing that's holding you back and stuff like that. But every top performer talks about the work ethic, right? So when you get to that place and you're looking back down the mountain, you're like, oh, I could have come up this way, this way, this way. What do you think the, like the biggest key is to making progress up the mountain for most people? Like, like, how do they, cause we're so stuck, man, like, damn. And I, like, I had to hang up the Cape, right. Cause you know, I am a, you know, liberal person, fairly progressive in my thoughts and everything. And I live in Fort Worth, Texas, which is not the biggest, most progressive liberal city in even, even in Texas. So, um, like I, I, I was always wearing the Cape and like trying to like do these stands on social media and stuff like that. And it, it was just terrible. So how do you get people? Because then, because then I go learn all the sales stuff and I'm like, cool, let's have conversations with it. Right. And the bad thing is, is the other person is like aware that they're being lured into this potential bear trap of a conversation. So then the conversation doesn't fundamentally take the same shape that it could if it was a walls down conversation. So how do you, how do you start people? Like, what's the one thing I should be telling people go do that to start to have that detachment? Um, for me, again, it was training, like formal training. And I started Same this, here. 
when I was 23, <laughs> you know, or 22 in grad school. And I've been studying it for, you know, 30 years. And it's like, there's so much here. There's so much to read. There's so many great lectures to listen to. And every time you do, it moves you up 0.004%. Yeah. And it's the same over a longer period of time as developing Kung Fu skills and things like that. Your brain has to adjust into this kind of perspective on the world so that it becomes super easy, super natural, super in, you know, intuitive. And like one of the things I tell people, like if you're doing any type of political persuasion at all, there's three stages that you have to get in your head. And if you can get these in your head, you'll be more of a pers political persuasion master than 99% of the world. And it's gather information is the first thing. And you can stay in that stage forever. And this, <laughs> That's where I love to hang out. <laughs> because there's so well, and, and every one of these people, no matter who they are, has a massive life that they've lived up to this point. And it has brought them to this political position. And if you don't know it, then you do not understand them. Yeah. And if you do not understand them, you are not going to persuade them. Sorry. You might do some blunt force trauma that moves them around with your persuasion, but deep persuasion in the sense of politics where they'll continue to vote. Say you want to take somebody from conservative to liberal. You don't want them to do in that kind of, or say they're doing it and then getting in the, in the booth and voting however they want. You want them completely converted and voting this way the rest of their lives. That's the true victory in politics. Yeah. And so information, like when I do conversions on people or, you know, political work on people, I just gather information constantly. I'm like, so tell me about that. You know, with absolute no judgment, because yeah. gathering information has to be this completely positive experience for them. If they feel yeah. negativity, they're out. Nobody wants to tell their life story to somebody that hates them. Oh man, that's oh god. I I, I was uh, I was so oblivious to that idea of if they don't think you get it, they're not going with you. Like I and I would use all these techniques and everything else like that, and then I would just like essentially not really listen because I'm so invested in the techniques and what am I going to do next and everything else like this. Like like the level of detachment from the conversation was was was. Too, Right. So they weren't feeling anything. And so it, you know, you get, uh, if you don't provide space for them to like be open and honest with you, they're going to tell you what they think you want to hear. Right. And as a salesperson, I'm going to be told any number of things. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, as a, as a sales leader for hire, right. Cause you can just hire me. I'll come in and I will lead your team. Like the thing that I have to argue with people the most is like, I give everybody who I coach and I work with like a lot of room to bitch and complain. Right. Cause uh, poker players have this, I think comedians have it as well, like in my study of them. And, and so it's like, there's this kind of jadedness that you have to create space for. Right. So that way you can talk about it. Yeah, that really sucks. Okay, great. But we, it goes past a certain point, it becomes cancerous, and then it's not it's not beneficial. But it's like poker players tell, telling a bad beat story, right? Or comedians being like, man, this joke works everywhere, but it bombed here. Don't know why, right? Part of it is like leaning into the group mind so that way you can get really great feedback. But you got to give people that space because if you don't, why'd you lose that deal? Boss, I don't know what happened. And then you don't know. And then that person is potentially so terrified of going and getting clarity about what happened on this deal, then they just won't. And then the whole rep was done for no great reason, right? Because the only way that we can win in those moments is when we get yeses. If we can figure out like why we got no's, we can begin to improve this whole thing, right? We can begin to like maybe take some of these ideas over to marketing and they can start to work with them. So that way we don't spend time talking to these people who don't understand these fundamental concepts, right? Why we're different, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah, um, and I, I, yeah. I think that's, you know, it's, you see guys that if you've been in something a long time, you've already gathered a lot of information about your audience, deep information. Yeah. You've been through this stuff with them. You watch people that have sold something for 15 years or whatever. They know what people basically are about when they come in because they have a mm -hmm. depth of knowledge. And yeah. so like in politics, again, nobody has any depth of knowledge about other people's life experience, about why they would grab onto this worldview. And so that's the first stage is just deep information gathering. And you have to learn how to information gather. You have to yeah. learn how to ask questions. You have to learn how to not be judgmental. 
And these are all real things. And nobody gets yep. trained in that stuff. So they're nobody. bad at that part of the discussion. And then you have to create an authentic relationship with this person, not a sales relationship or a persuasion relationship. None of that. Like, well, let's do this again. You know, I, I need to find out more about this. Or you need to tell them stuff about yourself. Like two of the strongest forces in interpersonal communication for relationship development are uh, self-disclosure and other discovery. And they're usually matched. So at a certain point, most people, unless they're sociopaths, will be like, well, I've been talking about myself a lot. What about you? Yep. And they'll, you know, a lot of times they'll turn to me, well, what are your politics? I'm like, well, my politics are different, I think. Like, first of all, I value comedy. So I, I, I'm looking for people that are best for comedy. Not to make fun of, but people who laugh easiest. And usually conservatives are a little uptight. You know? <laughs> they're hard to do comedy for, so they're not really my prime audience. Yeah. Liberals pretty easy to make them laugh. They're, you know, pretty laid back and happy and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So those are usually my people, but to, to create an authentic relationship using correct interpersonal techniques. And you do this a lot. I see it a lot in you when just talking to you, I'm like, Oh, you have some adept on interpersonalness. I can tell when you talk to people, you know, how to give positive feedback, you know, give compliments, you know, how to to restate what somebody says to show that you that you've heard about it you've said multiple times here this is so much fun you know how to to show positive emotion and those are all yeah. interpersonal skills that are super important for creating relationships if you can't do them people won't have a relationship with you they'll be talking to you but they'll be like ah, i'm back here yeah you want them up here you want them in front of themselves connecting to you and if you do those two things well, then maybe you can start moving over into some persuasion. Man. Yeah. Um, thank you for the, for the compliment, because I'm going to take it as a compliment. I, I think that, I, I think that lots of people would be like this manipulatively. I think you do it very authentically. Yeah. Like it's, it's very much in an effort of not um, yeah. The movie, uh, the big short, Right. You know, it's talking about the mortgage crisis and everything. And they're talking about how this guy is such a data guy that he just can't communicate with people. And uh, he, he sees someone and he's got a haircut. He's like, that's a nice haircut. Did you do that for yourself? And he just has no awareness that it's like a terrible question to like ask another human being. And I'm like, man, I am that guy. <laughs> I am so that guy. And so a lot of the coaching was uh, around these ideas. Like, um, like I'm kind of known now for being able to come up with like questions that get to the heart of things. Right. And it's like what people like want to work with me about, but like I tell everybody, it's like, this is just reps, like just do more of this and you will get there as well. Um, there's a thing there that is kind of unique, uh, that like, I don't think makes me like super great at it. Um, but I have a stutter. And so I was in speech therapy from kindergarten all the way up, all the way up through like ninth grade, right? When it got to get really uncomfortable about being the, the guy in speech therapy. And most of the therapists were just like, slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down. There was no technique, right? And then eighth grade moved, had a brand new therapist fresh out of school. And she gave me things to think about. Like, hey, don't just think about slowing down. Think about this other thing over here and gave me techniques to like think about. So that way I wouldn't fall into these things that were just so... Like at five or six years old, I told my mom, I said, I want to be a stand-up comedian. She goes, maybe not. Cause like the stutter was that bad, like couldn't make it through a whole sentence. And so the idea that technique was, go was going to allow me to do that was interesting. Right. And so now I'm at that place um, to where the stutter is still there. Right. So anytime I think about saying anything, I think of, I think I have a moment of pause of, am I going to be able to get this out? avoiding anything that might be a trigger for me that might make me stutter or do I need to say it slightly differently? It's so like, that's been like a practice since before I had these techniques, right? Um, you know, you're standing in front of someone and you can't get the words out and everything like you. Uh, and then you change the sentence fundamentally just that way you can get around this block. It becomes this habit that you do. So like whenever I think about what I'm going to say or how I'm going to say and stuff like this, it kind of goes through that filter allows me to kind of it, it makes it easier to add technique on, right? Nurturing statements, rapport building, stuff like this, because it's I'm just a product of good training. Well, so that's, that's why I try to tell everybody, it's, again, one of the reasons I like rhetoric so much. It's mechanical technique all the way through. It's not 
oh, you know, be your best authentic self and, you know, hold this flower for seven hours. It's, hey, here's a massive, you know, uh, collection of technique. Anybody can learn them. So is mm -hmm. stand up and so is comedy writing. Yeah. You know, there was some intuition in it, but I bet 93% of it is pretty formulaic. mechanical technique. Mm -hmm. And intuition only becomes useful when you can take it through the internalized technique. If you didn't internalize that technique, you're going to do bad comedy. I don't care what. Yep. And, and so it's very trainable. It's very teachable. I used to be married to a therapist, a psychotherapist, and she would, you know, go into the, you know, the deep inner. And I'm like, I don't care. What I care is I'm going to give them a list of mechanical techniques and we're going to practice those until they get really good at them and then see how well they communicate in this relationship. And I would love yeah. to put that up against what you got. I, it's, um, there's this great book, Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink and uh, his partner, Le Leif Babin. And, there, and the line in there is, it's not, uh, I'm sorry, you're not going to rise to the occasion. You're going to fall to your level of training, right? And as a martial artist, you're constantly being told that A, everybody overvalues their own ability to fight because they they honestly think that when you get so mad, you're going to be able to like overcome whatever is there in front right. of you. If Suddenly you're, if you're you'll just, find a new level of talent. What? Ex exactly. No, you're going to get romped by, by the person who has done this two more times than you are, unless you just have like a whole lot of other things, right? On, on, on your side. In Kung Fu, like one of the things that drew me to it was that it is so technique driven, right? Because it's not about being you know, the things that are usually important, bigger, stronger, faster, right? More time spent training and stuff like that. If you could learn a technique that allowed you to be fundamentally different in how you approached the, the, the altercation, you would be able to think about it differently and short, kind of short circuit other people because of like, they need to run it their way. And they've only ever seen it happen this way. So when I just step up in here and I'm going to take that first shot, because like, I'm in a range that you're not comfortable with, but I'm very comfortable with what? Like, it's like this huge pattern interrupts, you know, like, like, just like in like a good sales conversation, you know, of like, if you, if you don't want them to view you as a salesperson, you got to step into that space and you have to make them view you as a human. How, how are you going to do that? Lead with some conflict, lead with things that are important to you, because you might not have a huge window of time of them continuing to look at you as a human. So make your impact, ask your questions and then get out of there. Yeah, and it's, it's things like these shorthand scripts. And this is what I've really loved about doing lunch club. It's let me pitch out, I don't know, I've always got 10 or 15 things going and it's let me pitch them over and over again to where they can, they've been boiled down to incredibly effective, basic communication with some flavor to it, hook, yep. pitch. And so like the idea of ethical only persuasion, as soon as I say it, it changes the entire discussion. And it may yep. bring up questions. People are like, oh, what does that look like? And no, 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 no. I'm like, well, we can talk about all that, but just realize like, I've just done this massive set of ethos work on you because I've attached myself as my goal. My mission is to do ethical only persuasion to stop people from using unethical persuasion in the world. So you pull the curtain us. back right then. What? Like, like, like you pull the curtain back, like oh, all the time, Yeah. like right then you're like, like, I, I love this concept and it's something that I wish that I could do a better job of, but I always cool. Like, let's talk about what just happened because I'm just so excited to show you like the components of this thing that worked. Right. Because, um, in, in poker, like when you make the bet on the river, right. And if it's a bluff, the bluff only works. If the story, the other betting, everything up to that point makes sense. If it doesn't make sense then everyone's like, oh, I'm skeptical. I'm just going to look you up. So are you right. telling the whole story from front to back? Or are you doing this like very weird kind of like pattern that no one seems to understand? Well, let's just figure it out. Like, it's it, lunch club is a, is a, is a very cool thing because like, I think about it, like, like comedians call it like working some new, right. You know, of just like, Hey, is this going to work and stuff like that? And so you can be like, Hey, you know, we're, we're talking about putting together a group that did this and this and this, you know, is that a struggle for you? No. Okay, cool. Maybe I didn't say that right. Maybe just the wrong audio. You know what I'm saying? And so like, you get really, really clear feedback loops, which is really cool. Yeah. And there are weird things about communication in normal culture and everyday culture, the social contract that you're not supposed to meta your communication. You're not supposed to audit or analyze other people's. You're not supposed to make changes, point out dysfunctions, try to, you know, add in up functions. 
of but all the things again, I enjoy doing. <laughs> yeah. But because I'm a I'm an ex professor and I was a professor for 20 years and I have a PhD in a active human art, you know, an active pragmatic human tool that they go, Oh, you know a lot about this. And I'm like, Yeah, I'd love I'll give some of it to you for free if you want it. You know, and that's why like I do that kind of stuff because I know we're at a moment there where there's gonna there's a piece of super instruction just sitting there. And if I can get it to them, like they're going to change the way they see all of this stuff. So like, I, I was thinking about this earlier, this line, when you were talking, like I've studied, you know, rhetoric for 35 years to get really good at it so that I can bring my much better technique to our interactions so we can win. Like somebody needs to be the adept here. Somebody needs to have mastery of this so that we can both win in this situation. Cause that's not just natural. You know, it yeah. has to be crafted. And if, if that's why you've done this stuff, why you like, why you get good at sales, is it good? Are you getting good at sales so that you can be a good salesperson so that you can teach other people to be good salespersons? Are you doing it because you want to put good things into the world? Like, it sounds like that third one. I mean, I know you have those other sub purposes, but it sounds like you've reached a point, especially if you're calling yourself Sherpa, that <laughs> you're trying to get good things into the world, right? Yeah, the I was at a sales conference and I and I was just starting this thing, right? Like like actually had not even started it yet. I was I was working for a company in a startup. Me and, me and my business partner had split ways. We're at a sales conference. We'd gone to it every year, and you know we're, you're just kind of goal setting and doing the stuff, right? And I'm kind of going through it, and uh, they have the Zig Ziglar quote up there. It wasn't a Zig thing, but um, they have the Zig quote: "If you can have everything you want, if you help enough other people get what they want." And I'm like sitting there for a second, and I'm sitting there with like my coach, my old business partner, and Al, who's on our podcast, who's my old boss, who gave me my first B two B shot. Like, like these three people fundamentally impacted like me being there right me being the kind of person who's going to invest in himself to go onto a sales conference while not in a sales capacity and paying for it all out of pocket like john in 2010 would have thought that that was stupid just absolutely absurd or you know absurd so i'm sitting there and i'm having this moment of like being surrounded by these people who poured into me thinking about this moment from my kung fu teacher who like left a really great sales job at Lockheed to go do the Kung Fu thing full time. And it was just because people had poured into him. And I was like, and I'm like having this moment of feeling all this and reading this line. And I'm like, okay, like, let's try to build something like not just do like the tight, nice, tight consultant thing. Like, let's try to go do something else. And that's when it was like, let's build a bit of a team and how do we make this better? And that's where the book started to come from and more of like coaching and training and stuff, because I don't want anybody to not start a business because the sales thing is scary. Sure. Yeah. That's really the goal. Yeah. Well, it sounds good, man. We uh, Thank you. We've covered some ground here. We, we, we ground covered. I want to go deep dive into all the rhetoric stuff. Like I'm not going to get any work done for like the next, you know, ever. I think this is going to be a black hole. I might never emerge from. There are many caves in the deep dive. I've been in them for a long time. Again, it's it's one of the cool things about studying something that applies this widely in human experience is that it wanders fine over into philosophy. It wanders fine mm -hmm. over into semiotics and linguistics, psychology, literature. And so you can you can go wherever you want and just kind of apply these things and learn more and more about it, which uh, if people have an interest in it, go to my website. I've got a set of links there to get you started about things to read and things to look at, but it's endless. And I think the spillage, the spillover into your life structures and how you do your relationships and how you do your ethical act, act, action in the world and your choices, it's a really strong approach to the world, I think. And um, uh, it's become my thing in the last few years to get it out there. I did comedy for a long time, getting comedy out there. Mm -hmm. which I still kind of do, but I would really, I really want to see what rhetoric can do if we can uh, popularize it more. Absolutely. Right. The, I tell everybody the stuff we're going to talk about in here, you need to go do not in your sales conversations, because if you're only doing it in your sales conversations, you're going to feel inauthentic. So go practice, you know, asking questions with questions and stuff like this, and really just playing that very confused. Can you tell me more? Like, it's, it's cool that you already know the answer. That's great. 
you you might not know everything that is included in their view of that thing. So ask, right? Like if there's room to make an assumption, there's room to ask a question. So just ask. And, yeah, and the sub applications, the stuff are endless. That's why like I have persuasion for parents. Yeah. Because I'm like, I know I, I, when I look back and start to disassemble the way <laughs> I raised my kids, I'm like, yeah. oh yeah, I did a lot to them. And it I was get, all based on this rhetoric of, of how you create thinking, how you create a communication foundation yeah. and orientation to things like interchange and influence. And you, if you do it consciously, if you're like, oh, there's great ideas over here, harvest those and just kind of seep them into your kids, you get great payback. Like it's, my kids are just awesome. They, <laughs> with like creating content and stuff like this, it, it, everybody is like, man, John is always looking for content. It's like, I'm not always looking for content. It's just like, it's there when you're looking for it. Like my daughter has taught me so much about sales and conversations and like when people make decisions and what happens after that, because, you know, the kid doesn't ever talk you into the cookie. Once you say like, no, you're not having a cookie. I've made up my mind. And then like, from that point on, it feels very much like a sales conversation. Okay. So like you, when you can look at it in that way, in this thing that is like the polar opposite of this thing that you don't want anything to do with, right? Like, Oh, John, I'm not a salesperson. Cool. You know, you know, you're selling your kids when you tell them to go do their yeah. homework and to build good habits and good routines. Like it's the same thing, right? Yeah. Well, no, that's just being a good parent. Well, mm -hmm. maybe if you just think about this thing as being a guide, maybe a little bit more broadly, we can start to see how these things are kind of similar, right? The way you talk to your kids, if you want them to take action, you got to provide space so that way they want to come talk to you about these things. Because if you just shut it down, they're going to go talk about it with someone else. Yeah. Right? It, Salespeople, endless. the people on your team, clients and prospects, it's all the same, right? Endless. Good stuff, man. I really appreciate you jumping on today. We'll have to circle back around and do another one of these. Thank you so much, man. This was, this, was, this was a blast. I appreciate it. Yeah. How can people find you? Just hit it up real quick. Absolutely. Uh, best way to get in touch is just adaptedgrowth.com. We have the book on there. We have information about the podcast. If you want to talk about this stuff in a ROI driven way in the form of sales, we'd love to talk about it. But uh, the book is a great place to start where we kind of lay the foundation behind all this stuff. Yeah. Give a uh, John business rhetorician Hill a call. He's got a lot of stuff to say and, and uh, super valuable too. I think you've got a, you've got a nice mix of you know, a sensitivity to what it means to, you know, try to influence actual human beings in the world and a sensitivity to what businesses need in order to survive. And uh, yeah, I think you walk that line really well. So definitely go check out John's stuff at Adapted Growth. Good, good Thank you, talk, man. man. Thank All you right, so This much. has been the Rhetoric Warriors podcast. We will see you next time. And again, as always, get out there and persuade some people. They always need it.